Chapter three covers federalism. As you might remember from the previous chapters, federalism is a system that links the unitary system versus, uh, and the confederal system um, in order to have a balance in power between the national and the subnational government. In the United States, that's our national, United States, federal, we use all of those terms to talk about the central government and then we call our subnational governments the states. So when we look at federalism today, we're going to uh, see how it relates to the United States in particular. A common metaphor used in a discussion of federalism is the marble cake versus the layer cake, or as a lot of textbooks use as their key terms, shared or cooperative federalism versus dual federalism. If you look at the marble cake, the marble cake is representative of a system of government where the two levels, the national government and the state government, uh, work together, each utilizing their strengths. Um, sometimes a state government has certain uh, powers and abilities, like if we look at the coronavirus incident, uh, state governments are typically responsible for public health, and we see state governors taking a lead uh, in the area of public health. Well, the national government has a lot of resources and ability to uh, gain access to money. In fact, we saw before, right, that coining money is a responsibility of the U.S. government. So the U.S. government created where it didn't exist before through borrowing and printing of money trillions of dollars while at the same time uh, rules regarding you know whether a public beach was to be open or not often fell to the governors of the individual states so by working together and sometimes working in conflict with each other um, the idea of marble cake or shared federalism says that each of the different levels of government do what they do best uh, provide and therefore provide government to everyone. Now the layer cake uh, approach, uh, maybe a more traditional constitutional law approach, is based on a delineation or separation of the types of things that the national government does versus what the state government does. And so we often focus on, you know, what are the powers of the gov of the U.S. government. What areas does the U.S. government uh, ultimately most in charge of versus what do the states primarily do and what are the powers of the states? Uh, again, the marble cake approach is a little bit more uh, what a public policy specialist would focus on, while the layer cake approach is a little bit more of what a constitutional law um, student or researcher would focus on. One of the most important concepts that we should think about when we're talking about federalism is the idea of sovereignty. You might recall when we're talking about federalism that we're saying that both the national government and the state government have independent relationships with their citizens. So in a unitary system, we say there, yes, there are subnational governments, but citizenry is something that exists entirely between the national government and the individual. Uh, when we talk about a confederation or a confederal approach, uh, what we're saying is that the primary relationship with the citizens is with their state or subnational government and then the states have a independent relationship with the national government and the people only work through their states to their representation in the national government. Well, in a federal system, you know, we talk about, you know, where does the power come from? Well, the power comes from the people, but the power of the people is one of uh, the people are citizens of their state in the U.S., we often refer to them as residents because the way you become a citizen of a state is you're a U.S. citizen who resides in a state. 
and there's also the citizenry of the United States. So in a republic, we say power comes from the people, but the power that comes from the people in a federal republic is from the people to the state and separately from the people to the national government. Now here's a review of of the three different forms of government. Remember, when people talk about a unitary system, often there's a confusion between when we say unitary and when we say authoritarian. That's not it at all. A unitary system, a confederation, a federal system, they're all different forms of democratic or republic gov Republican governments. So, a unitary system, it can be a democracy where the people elect the national government and the subnational government is appointed by the national government. In a confederation, again, it could be a democratic system where the people choose the leaders of their states and then the states choose the national government. In our federal system, this relationship, it's as though you are a citizen of two different republics, your state government and your national government. Now we're going to talk, right? Obviously the national government today in the United States is much more powerful than the state governments. But if, as you see with the relationship between the president and the various governors, Governors do not work for the President of the United States. Governors are representatives of the government of the state, which is chosen by the people of that state. So where does the power come from? When we talk about the power of state governments, why do we understand that state governments have power in the United States? Well, one of these is tradition. The United States was formed from the 13 original states that existed before the current U.S. government did. In fact, before the United States was even independent, these states existed under charters from the British government, from the United Kingdom. In addition, when we talk about a federal system, there's a theoretical basis to say that the powers of the national government are few and only whatever was defined by the states when they came together to create it. But the state governments are have all of the rest of the power that's traditionally accorded to a government. Um, now we look at some of the specific aspects in the Constitution that were designed to make states powerful. Now, the U.S. Senate is a uh, important, probably the most important of the two houses in our uh, legislative branch of government. And the United States Senate uh, is chosen on basis of every state being equal. So there's no greater reminder that we are a federal system and that states have a certain dignity um, that supersedes just being a subdivision of the U.S. government in that no matter how small you are, if you are a state, Wyoming has the same representation in the Senate as California, which is the largest. And this is set up in a way that um, this is in the uh, chamber of the Congress that is the most powerful. Going a step farther, the U.S. Senate was usually comprised, was originally comprised of people who were elected by state legislators. There was not even direct election of senators. Senators were there to do the bidding of the state legislator. So in addition to this, the 10th Amendment to the Constitution reserves all of the powers that are not given to the U.S. government by the Constitution to the states. It says there's even more powers out there, but if we didn't name them, 
they are left to the states to determine whether to utilize them or not. And then the 11th Amendment says that states can't be sued in federal court without their permission. Now this has been modified by the 14th Amendment, which now says that states can be sued in federal court over civil rights, but they can't be sued in federal court uh, over those things that states traditionally do other than civil rights. Now, I hope it's not a giant surprise to you that the national government is more powerful than the states. And there are several aspects of the U.S. Constitution which point to this greater power. Uh, Article 6 of the Constitution actually says that in those areas that the U.S. government is allowed to act, which, you know, as we interpret it today, is many, many different areas. In those areas where the U.S. government is allowed to act, they have supreme power. So when the U.S. government takes control of a public policy, the states have to fall in line. The original Constitution didn't talk, for instance, much about environmental protection. But once it was determined that environmental protection was going to be something that government uh, took an interest in, and the U.S. government decided to take an interest in it, then the uh, EPA, the U.S. EPA, became more powerful and more important than the state uh, environmental protection agencies. And there's numerous other examples of this other than the things that we often treat as obvious, like military power, which the national government has the primary responsibility for. Then you start to look at the Constitution itself in each of the different sections of the Constitution. You know, when we look at Article I, the powers of Congress, it lists numerous powers of the Congress, particularly in Article I, Section 8, that, that, that Congress, things Congress is allowed to do. Take that with Article VI. Anything that Article I lists as a power of Congress is also saying that the United States government has more authority than the state governments in that area. Article 2 talks about the powers of the president. And so anything that's listed as something the president can do, that becomes a power that's listed in the Constitution that the U.S. government has supreme authority over. Similarly, Article 3 lists the types of cases that the federal courts can deal with. And so when it comes to uh, those those uh, federal questions. We will talk about that more in our um, chapter nine. Uh, when we talk about federal questions, they can't be overruled by state courts. And then also Article four talks about several different uh, guarantees of, uh, of state authority and of state relations, uh, either to their people or amongst themselves that the U.S. government is given authority over. Um, these are very sweeping. They don't list every possible power, but they certainly, they, they certainly do give a great deal of authority to the national government, especially as we interpret it today. Now, this wasn't always the case. Uh, the national government was not always so much more powerful than the state governments. Originally, uh, we would probably say that the state governments were more powerful than the national government. And part of this is because of our understanding of the way of life today versus the way of life in the 18th century. When the US government was originally created, uh, most people lived most of their life engaging in commerce on a local level. So if a person who lived down the street from you uh, made the harnesses for your horses, then that doesn't, that doesn't uh, cause the, uh, th that doesn't cause the U.S. government to get involved at all. 
But when you think of the things that you utilize in your life most today, uh, I often in class talk about a cellular telephone. You know, many, many of the uh, components of cell phones are made in other countries, China and other Asian countries often, but certainly not in the United States. My cell phone uh, is, uh, 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 my, cell, my, my cell phone uh, company, my cell phone carrier is Verizon. Uh, Verizon used to be uh, the Bell Telephone Company of New York and New Jersey. And so when you look at Verizon, you say, whoa. So I have a, I have a, I have a New York telephone company. I have a phone that was made in a foreign country. And I have internet service. Uh, I have internet service from a company from out of state. And almost, so thus almost everything I do, uh, I do using my, my cell phone. I'm engaging in interstate commerce uh, with almost everything I do, even though I work for the state of Georgia. Many of the rest of you work for companies that are based outside of the state of Georgia. Uh, many of you, uh, many of you do at least half of the things that you live that you do in your life uh, involve interstate commerce. This would have been completely different before. Well, if the US government has authority over interstate commerce, then you can see why the power of the national government has grown. In addition, the ability of the national government to borrow money, uh, which is listed in the Constitution, is much greater than that of the state. If the uh, state of Georgia had said, you know what, I think we need to create three trillion new dollars to deal with the coronavirus outbreak or some other problem. Uh, investors would just laugh at them. The U.S. government says, yeah, let's do that. And, uh, and it happened. So obviously, when it comes time for governments to uh, engage in programming, the national government often creates money that it then gives to the states uh, with strings attached. So that's going to lead to the states doing more and more of the national government's bidding. Wars, obviously the national government has authority over the military and over diplomacy. So when we have wars, uh, we're, we're going to have to give more power to the national government. As late as World War I, um, they, uh, there wasn't an understanding that the President of the United States would be allowed to draft people into the military, and they had to create a fiction where the governors of the states were making their militias available to the President to uh, choose some of the people in the militia, which if you look at state constitutions, militias actually comprise all of the adult citizens of the state. Well, by making the militia available, that authorized the president to have a draft. Well, today, we just understand that the president, if, we were to, if Congress were to pass a law authorizing a draft that, um, that it would be constitutional. Economic calamities, and I guess I should throw in there uh, health calamities, right? When it, when it comes time to, to get money, when it comes time to coordinate activities across the country, it often uh, falls to the national government to do that. Uh, the direct election of senators with the 17th Amendment, all of a sudden, a senator became somebody not who was uh, doing the bidding of a, of, of a state legislature, but instead the senator was somebody who was going to the people of the state saying, elect me and I will do national government things. So senators who before uh, had uh, a strong incentive to do what their state government asked, all of a sudden had a strong incentive to do what the people of the state wanted in terms of helping the national government help the people. 
The 14th Amendment with civil rights gave all sorts of powers to the, uh, to the national government to override the 10th and 11th Amendments uh, in order to guarantee citizens uh, certain equal protections under the law. And then finally, voting rights. Many constitutional amendments have extended voting rights. Well, prior to the passing of uh, laws saying that you have to let minorities vote and women vote and young people vote, the decision on who could vote was left to the states. So these are, this is a greater nationalization of power. So, you know, we, we, we see here, we, we see here uh, a much stronger national government than the state governments are. When, whenever you have a, uh, a comparison where at the beginning I say, the power of the state comes from tradition and versus I can say the power of the national government comes from, from money and military power and control over who gets elected. Let's, let's balance tradition versus facts on the ground. And I think we see that the national government is rather strong. Now I'm gonna finish by pointing out several concepts from the key terms, which are going to be um, fair game for quizzes and exams, but also important concepts to understand that just sort of get fitted in somewhere or another in our understanding. First of all, there's a specific type of legislation called preemption legislation, which Congress can pass that specifically points or, or tells the courts that now the national government has taken an interest in this area and that it's an area that is recognized as being a power of government um, in the U.S. Constitution and that the states are no longer to have any significant choice over. Uh, well, this, this type of legislation called preemption legislation um, has been used to increase the power of the national government over the states. Unfunded mandates are something that are that is debated in court all the time. The idea of whether the national government can tell the states to do something that the national government can't do on its own, uh, but that states are allowed to do, could the national government tell the states could the national government order states to carry out certain activities? Usually the courts say no. However, the courts have said that the US government can threaten to withhold funding from state governments who do not do certain things. So for instance, the way that the uh, national drinking age was raised to 21 in the United States. And similarly, back when the, um, the national speed limit was 55 miles an hour. The way the national government did this was to threaten to withhold highway funds from states that did not uh, comply with these rules. Well, because the national government funds a great deal of the cost of building and maintaining the interstate highway system, states didn't really have the choice of saying, no, we will not do this. And the US Supreme Court said that states could choose not to take the money and then not have to do it, but that the national government did have the power to withhold the highway funds if they wanted to. Two similar concepts, cutthroat competition and race to the bottom. Cutthroat competition is this idea that state governments can um, seek to have the very best businesses, most productive citizens by, um, by offering incentives to have these people move to your state. And you've seen uh, where states will uh, give tax abatements, uh, will uh, do things to increase the uh, benefits to businesses and individuals who they want to have move to a state. 
The other side of this, the race to the bottom, states have no incentive to have certain people move to their state. These would be people who do not create more wealth than, than, their, than the tax money that's required to support them. And so wealthy people, the states compete to get um, poor people, the states tend to cut off um, benefits to poor people. And in return, those poor people are, become less likely to live in the community. Um, you know, and you, and you can see this, right, that, um, that if, if you had the most generous uh, social welfare system in your state, that people who are poor would move to that state. Um, this has been not, not suggested as a good thing, but suggested as um, a result that can be demonstrated in the policies of state governments. And uh, there was a lot of research on this in the early part of the 21st century. Well, anyway, you should look at these four ideas and you should expect quiz and exam questions where you would know this. So um, as, we, uh, as we carry on through the rest of the semester, pay particular attention to federalism and how it affects the um, affects the national government and the state governments um, in the areas of the different branches of government and civil rights and civil liberties, uh, even in elections. So this is an important concept for us going forward.